exam. <laughs> really, really, really. I said, this is the exam. <laughs> So online spaces, social media spaces, Twitter, <coughs> Facebook. Personally, I can't bear Facebook. I don't use Facebook for this purpose, but I can see it having a real value and it's <coughs> having value in my own work for, for Twitter. There, there's a space there where students can contribute and I can contribute as a lecturer too in that space. I wouldn't have said this two years ago, but I'm saying it now. Okay, so let's have a look at a quick couple of myths and misconceptions around taking things into the online space. First myth or misconception is people say online assessment is much more difficult than conventional assessment. But the converse is also true. Uh, online assessment is also easier than conventional assessment in some ways. So we need to hold these things in tension with one another. It depends on the activity, it depends on the purpose again, and it depends on the role that we play as lecturers in that online space in the assessment. So in some cases it can be, and this is the worry, is that we can simply move, <coughs> excuse me, physical, face-to-face, -face, or conventional, let's rather call it conven conventional form of assessment into an online space. I think that's a bad idea. I think that's not helping us to think about the particular affordances of either space, in fact. So we need to be much more clear about what does the face-to-face -face or conventional assessment practice help us to do that can't be done in an online space. By the way, it's the same for the, I presume, lecture recording is becoming an increasing practice in this institution like it is in mine. So there again, it's a question about saying, if I do lecture recording, then what do I have to do in the face-to-face -face lecture context that is not the same as the lecture recording? What's the value of the lecture recording there? I mean, of the face-to-face -face engagement. Otherwise, don't, let's not bother. Let's just record the whole thing and not bother with the physical you know, classroom. What are we doing in the classroom space that, that we can't do in the online space? So it's the same in assessment. What are we doing in the online space that we can't do in the face-to-face -face space? Then there are other conceptions that, that occur in this space that I, that I also think we should head on or head off. That oral assessment is much more subjective than written assessment. Assessment of social practice tells us no way. Any form of assessment is highly subjective, interpretive, if, if, sorry, <coughs> if subjective means interpretive or open to judgment, um, open to lack of reliability, etc. Text-based assessment is just as prone to those kinds of unreliabilities. I much rather prefer to think of this notion of subjectivity and objectivity, not about, because usually subjectivity here means flaky. You know, oh, it's, it's flaky, it's not, it's not reliable. I rather think of subjective object as being subjective, a judgment which is made by the individual within, and objective as a judgment which, which is made by people outside of the assessment event. That's why we have moderators, that's why we have colleagues who, for example, sit with us in making judgments in an oral examination set setting and so on. That's an attempt to bring objectivity, not reliability, although that comes from it, it's an attempt to bring more independent outside judgment to the act of assessment in this particular case. So why I say this point is that I think in an online space there are great opportunities to do oral assessment, to record oral assessment, to have even the judgments made about it, provided that again students have know that it's coming, they've been prepared to do it, they're used to it as an activity, they have a strong rubric that they understand that's come with that oral assessment, and preferably there's more than one person making the judgment. In my faculty of health sciences, for example, student demands last year, one of the demands was there should be one, more than one person making judgments about oral clinical examinations. I thought to myself, yes, that's just good practice. Never mind whether it's done or not done, in, in it's just good practice to have more than one person making that judgment. So and that could potentially, especially in formative assessment, could include students themselves, peers, provided that they know what they're making judgments about. My point about, you know, font size. I mean, that's not what we want students to be making judgment about. We want them to make substantive judgments which they learn as part of becoming disciplined people, professionals later on. I think formative learning can be assessed, by the way, provided that the assessment is a participatory kind of co-constructed activity. So it's, but there are some writers in the field who claim 
you can also assess formative, assess, uh, formative development as part of the requirement of the course. That's going to be tricky and difficult because it's not typical and it's not safe space. So how does one do that? I mean, for example, it takes a strong academic, for example, to say, I think that the most important <coughs> learning in this course is the change from, say, a misconception to a very sophisticated conception. And I'm going to reward the people who show the most change in this field. That's a formative judgment, and I'm going to give them good marks for that judgment. I'm not interested necessarily so much in the product as I am in the process, and it's the process that I'm going to give marks to. I'd like to hear your comment about that because that's quite tricky terrain. Because again, students themselves don't trust that that well. They think much more about the judgment we make about their product because that's what we've always done. We're not used to making process-oriented judgments and having them as high stakes assessment judgments. But I think it's possible, and again, it needs mediation. It needs mediation at every level. It needs perhaps a commitment at a whole department level to do it that way, to connect that to other departments and professions and so on. And I understand those. I understand the, the constraints in which we operate in the assessment process, including the constraints of student perception, because those are quite strong. And alumni. GSB, in our case, at one stage, attempted to change a particular kind of assessment in one of their courses, the Graduate School of Business. Where did they get the most resistance to the change in formal assessment? From the alumni, who said, we didn't have to go through that, we went through a much more rigorous test. What are you doing? You're softening the qualification. You know, that kind of stuff. So it, it's, it does take energy, it does take a change of mindset around this concept of assessment. But I think, like I was saying right at the offset, I think the online space is a golden space for us to do much more formative kind of assessment. Idiosyn not idiosyncratic, um, opportunistic <coughs> assessment. You know, particular issues come up. Students are not clear from a lecture. Something can go online that very day. What's going on here? You didn't seem to get this. Please read X or watch this video or um, talk to one another. We're going to have a forum you know, over the next three days in which you discuss your beliefs or your conceptions of this particular point, and then we're going to discuss it in class. So that serves a number of purposes. It brings the purpose of the classroom engagement into a different space. It's not just a conventional lecture anymore. It's based on what students have talked about overnight or in, in an online space. <clears throat> okay, I'm nearly done. So why online learning at all then? And these are just some sort of concluding points I want to make about as, as, a, as a, okay, I'll say semi-convert to the online space. I'm not convinced that the online space, and I don't ever will, I will never be convinced <coughs> that the online space is the only space that we can operate in. However, under conditions such as we're faced with at the moment at the university, it is the only space we can offer, except maybe we go and find a coffee shop somewhere or a... But that, that precludes or means that we're not considering the possibilities, the strong possibilities, that more and more of our students will not physically be in the institution, as I'm sure is happening at this university as well. We will have truly international <coughs> classrooms with students anywhere in the world at any time zone in the world. That it's going to be difficult to organize a cup of coffee together. Virtual coffee, I suppose. Okay, so why online learning? I like to think of it as a continuum from these very informal spaces to guided reflective moments to highly intentional structured learning moments and by that by extension to um, high stakes moments as well. And there are plenty of examples and growing numbers of examples of of assessment, high stakes assessment, formal assessment being taken into an online space. I'd like to hear from, from you what, what is happening about those tricky issues about security and you know the identity of the student who's taking the exam. But there are systems, there are whole worldwide bodies of proctoring going on that will help us to address some of those issues where students, where, where it, which, which make it extremely difficult, if not impossible, for students to write somebody else's exam for them, for example, which is a fear. Yes, it's a real fear. Then I think also it's a continuum from, and this is where the online space really can help us, from student-directed and led to lecture-directed and led. There are really 
there ought to be and there probably are possibilities where students are the only arbiters, if you like, of the assessment judgments they're making in particular areas. But they need feedback, they need mediation, they need some sense that what they're doing is not just sharing ignorance, for example, which that's, that's not, that's counterproductive. It's a space for dialogue and meaning making, it's a really useful space for that. If I had done my work properly on that occasion that I set the task for my postgraduate students, I would have been much more in dialogue with them, talking to them, saying, come on, what's, what is your conception of evaluation in this space? What, is, you know, what do you think? How does your view differ from so-and-so's view? How does your view differ from the, the expert view in the case? I would have got the expert to participate in the video. I will do next time. You know, get, get the writer to come into the, into the space and actually participate if they're willing to. And they're in the right time zone, and the time zone that they can cope with. It's a, it's a, online space is also, for me, a really strong <coughs> practice or tryout space where, again, things can be recorded. Um, students can work with one another. They can, they can fail and they can try again in a, really, in a really sort of supported environment if the signal is right. It's a knowledge building space. It's certainly a space for challenge from one another and from ourselves. And it's certainly a learning community space. That doesn't tell us about how students learn, but it cr creates useful ideal conditions in which students can learn <coughs> from one another provided that they, again, are supported and mediated in that process. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to suggest we spend some time raising other issues that maybe haven't come up in this space, um, talk a bit further, ask some questions of one another, perhaps, and maybe even contribute insights from, from different perspectives. Sorry, I did have one more, one more slide. I thought I was done. These are the design issues that I think are really important in making online environment choices. I said the learning purpose is really important. One issue which we haven't raised in, on this slide is the question of student autonomy. Um, there's a lot of work being, being undertaken at the moment about the extent to which student agency is either suppressed or supported or facilitated <coughs> in the online space. Again, I think it really is important for us to think about the role we play. How much, how much uh, license, if you like, or how much a bit, um, permission do we give to students in the online space that can support, um, can facilitate student agency and autonomy in the space. But it also means that we've got to be thinking quite strongly about critiquing and evaluating the space. I think your example, Sue's example earlier today about what happened to the marks of students as a result of further engagement online. Those kinds of critical evaluations of <coughs> the consequences of doing online assessment as opposed to conventional assessment, really important. And I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll know more in perhaps three or five years' time than we do now. But there are cognitive, affective, and social issues, and including not only the, what we're assessing, but also for students. Some students don't like the online environment space. They, they do not believe it helps them to learn. In fact, they prefer the face-to-face -face space. So we've got to navigate those spaces because, again, in the real world, if we end up with students who are not physically <laughs> on campus, we will have to engage in online spaces or have separate classes, you know, one for the online space and one for the face-to-face -face space, for example, with the attendant resource implications and energy level problems. I mentioned learning analytics as, a, as an issue. It, it is very much an affordance, but it's also a concern. There are people in this country who are writing much more animatedly in that space than I would do. Paul Prince, for example, at UNISA, saying very strongly this analytics thing has become a kind of a surveillance, uh, uh, um, um, what's, yeah, surveillance mechanism uh, to make all kinds of spurious claims about student engagement and involvement as a result of their participation in online spaces and so on. Okay, that's, that's an extreme view. Maybe somewhere in the middle there's something, there is some middle ground here for the use of analytics, what, and, and the use of analytics as feedback, both to students and ourselves. We notice, uh, somebody raised, yes, you now the, uh, raised the question about pe people who do participate, people who don't participate. We, we don't want to be saying to the people who don't participate, you're going to fail if you don't participate. We need to understand better, what does it, make, what does it mean if they don't or do, do or do not participate? 
and analytics can help, can contribute. It doesn't solve the problem. It does, it's not causal in its relation to what students do online, but it can help us collect data, provided we use that data advisedly. <clears throat> and then there are ethical issues, clearly. Things that are for the record, online environments, <coughs> having students try out ideas in a formative space, which we then later on go on to say is a bad idea or is wrong, try it this way. What are the ethical implications of that? What are the ethical implications of participation, of the fact that you know, this, this is for the record? What if students say, well, actually, I want to withdraw from this process. I don't want to be recorded yet. What are we going to do? Are we going to remove them from the recording, give them the opt-out option? We've got that problem currently with lecturers in, in our institution, the challenge where lecturers are saying they want to opt out of, um, opt out of uh, lecture recording. What do we do with that? Do we give people the right to opt out or not and so on? So there will be those kinds of ethical issues. And uh, yeah, okay, I think I'm going to stop here. These are just some examples of you know, the focuses we could have in terms, of, in terms of where we place our emphasis in assessment. I think I've mentioned most of these points already. There's some real value in online space for students sharing their work with one another. And we can also share annotated or, um, what's the word? Oh, do. Annotated uh, rubrics with students, annotated best responses to questions. You know, this was a good example and anonymized, I guess. Good example of a response to this question. See what the person did. Notice how there are transitions between X and Y. Look at the reasoning in paragraph 10, you know, because this is what it did, you know, that, kind of, that gives us a chance to give feedback to the entire class on the basis of one submission in an online space. That's really useful, uh, a, a really useful possibility. Okay, just last <laughs> I promise I shall stop after this. These are our choices in the assessment in the online space. Do we, how much do we discuss with students? What external participants do we bring into the process? Like another lecturer who comes in to comment on students' work in an online forum or blog space, for example. The count or not count we've started to touch on earlier. Uh, what counts is really important, as I say, we must decide what it is that we want to give marks to. If the grappling, <coughs> the grappling with the concept is really critical, then that's what should count. That's what the marks should be for. <coughs> But we will fight with students, especially the excellent students, who will say, but I kind of got it all right, and I'm not getting a mark for grappling, because it didn't matter to me. I didn't need to grapple. I knew it all from the outset. We have got issues with that. Intentions are important. The rubric I mentioned, and the question about whether it's formative or summative is also very really important. OK, I think this really is the end. So let's talk. Let's have questions or comments, or observations. We've got 20 minutes or so for that. change in affordances changes the, the game in terms of what we can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. and, and to extend that point, I suspect that the online environment is going to irreversibly change that, like the printing press irreversibly changed the lecturer standing in a pulpit and talking, talking to the monks, or whatever was happening in the medieval days. So, yes, sorry, there were other... I just to make a comment on the formative mm. assessment. Mm. I do my last assignment is a three prong assignment. And the first one you have to reflect. It's a reflected essay on the page to page and on, on the forward aspects. Mm. And what you get out of it is just my goal. Mm. How when they actually in practice 
thinking back of what happened in our academic life, mm -hmm. what it's done to me when I come from another faculty where we just sit, we cannot speak, mm -hmm. the confidence they've built, being able to speak, to stand up, it's my problem. So that is how I try to find out the quality of my work that comes out of that. Mm -hmm. And it gives you feedback. The wonderful and it doesn't necessarily have to be a text-based thing either. They could talk it. They could, you could record it, for example. That's what online gives us now that we didn't have opportunities for before. What do you think is most difficult in an online environment is the, the real-time yeah. uh, exam. Um, so, of course, we go into things like um, take-home exams and sort of the next day. Type exams. Um, do you think we're losing something crucial there? Or can we live without real-time exams? Um, well, we are living without real-time exams. Now what is happening is uh, people are putting in the, in the universal international higher education space, people are making exams available across time zones by leaving the assessment up for X number of hours and it then progressively becomes available across those time zones. So we are moving that way already. I think your question is more important, almost like what are we gaining and losing by doing this? Are we losing something? It comes back again for me always to purpose. Why do we do this in the first place? So because once we have that orientation towards the process, we're going to, I think, anticipate and understand the possible consequences of doing it that way, including things like what will it take for students to do an examination in that kind of fashion? Have they been supported to learn to do it that way, etc. So I'm not, I don't think it's 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 not a universal again panacea. It's also not it's not a panacea. It's also not a, an entirely problematic space to be in. There, there are ways around it. Yeah. Well, of course, it brings the, the problems with um, with that student that needs to sure. and, and people writing that. Yeah. So so again, the question: What does it take to avoid that kind of trouble? <coughs> Proctoring, proctoring, yeah. So there are spaces that are available where students can come from anywhere in the world and write an yeah. exam. Yeah. And they simply go out for their ideas. Yeah. That that had that that's what's current practice. That's what's done around the world in, for example, standardised assessments. Again, back to my psychometric traditions. That's what's done in that kind of space. Um, it, again, it, the institution has to decide whether that's possible, what it's going to cost in every way, you know, finance as well as resourcing what it's going to take, how important is it? I think that was my question right at the outset. Is it worth that kind of effort? Can we change the way we do assessment? That means we don't have to do that. We don't have that. But if, if it is important, and it is deemed to be the kind of real opportunity to test student learning, then we have to move things to make it happen, I think, in that kind of way. Um, OK, we've got three questions. Uh, uh, I'm working in the online um, environment mm. and um, but my concern is more uh, especially the the, the, um, sorry, the integrity of the, the system itself. Mm. For an example, um, uh, as I can put the traditional exams where <coughs> the students sit down and they paint in their books and their papers were taken yeah. away, it's not supposed to be or they should be put um, um, cheating, then it's like professional responsibility. Mm. Now, we have been taking the, the, the um, theory papers as online, um, where students now can do their assessments um, off campus, at home, mm -hmm. and stuff. Well, we don't actually have the control of mm -hmm. seeing the sitting with their books, and it is um, sure. some of the assessment. But is your, okay. Um, okay, so, so, so a couple of things are happening in the international space. Multiple forms of the same assessment, for example. So not all students get the same assignment. That's tricky, though, and we know that's tricky, but it's possible to do it that way. I think the other thing, the other question that it raises for us is, is to ask why do students cheat? What, what, what enable, what, what, what creates the conditions? Okay, some maybe we can decide are oh, beyond redemption horrible people, but that's, that's not the vast majority.